Hello, my name is Raven Schwab Curtis. I'm black and Jewish, and today I'm gonna to be making challah from scratch. So it's about 10.30 a.m. right now, and I'm starting early because if you know anything about making bread, it's a pretty time intensive process. Okay, so what is challah? Challah, challah, challah at you, girl. <laughs> I'm gonna be making some bad, some bad challah jokes uh, throughout the video, so that's something to look forward to. So challah is a braided bread of Ashkenazi Jewish origin that we typically eat for various celebrations and holidays. So for example, today is Friday, which means that at sundown it will be Shabbat, and uh, that's part of why I'm making challah today for Shabbat. So why am I doing this? I'm making this video because I'm black and Jewish, and I have recently been on a journey to really connect with my Jewish heritage. I was raised by my mom, who is black. My dad is an Ashkenazi Jew. So I've always felt a lot more connected to my blackness and my specifically black Southern heritage. And so as an adult, I really am carving out space for the first time to explore my Jewishness, um, my Jewish culture, Jewish background, and part of that is food. Cuisine and food are such an important part of uh, how we come to know ourselves and our people. So, with that being said, I've made challah once before, so this is my second go at it. The only grievance that I have for the first time I made the challah was that it was a little hard, it wasn't as soft as I wanted it to be. For a first go, I was very proud of myself. <laughs> I asked you all to submit questions for a Q&A on Instagram about my black and Jewish identities. So I'm gonna be answering those as we make the holla together. This is kinda of gonna be an all day affair. So we're gonna be hanging out today. And without further ado, let's jump into it. All right, so I'm grabbing my laptop so I can have the instructions right here in front of me. So if you see me looking down, I'm not looking at your boobs or your chest. I'm looking at my, my laptop. Okay, so I need one cup of lukewarm water. So we need to warm up one cup of lukewarm water let's get our yeast packet so i'm supposed to cut here it seems easy enough so far boom bada bing bada boom all right our water is ready Ooh, this might not be lukewarm this might just be hot you know i had a feeling that that one minute was going to be too long and i should have trusted my instinct i'm going to put this in the freezer for a couple seconds and see if that cools it down <laughs> While we're waiting for our water to cool down, <laughs> let's go ahead and answer our first question. I'm pulling up your questions. Hello, Editing Raven, jumping in very quickly. I just wanted to say I'm very sorry. I forgot to screenshot the like little question response thing on Instagram when y'all sent the questions in. So I promise I didn't just pull these questions out of my ass. These are real questions from you. I just like didn't take a screenshot and I'm editing this video a month after the fact, so. I promise they're real, okay? Just trust me. <laughs> how do people perceive you and you with family? I think it varies. I mean, having a presence on social media, people are always debating and negotiating what my identity is, what kind of language I should be allowed to use to describe myself, which when I first started doing this whole thing was very disconcerting. I feel like now I'm confident enough in myself and how I come to know myself that those opinions don't sway me as much, but of course, how the world perceives you impacts you. So I think it runs the gambit. I mean, there are some people who have said that I'm white passing. There are some people who just outright will ask me that very annoying question, what are you? Which like, don't ask people that. <laughs> or if you wanna know, don't ask it in that way. There's something about that phraseology that's just really annoying, honestly. And then there are other folks who clearly recognize that I'm mixed or biracial or whatever language uh, you know, they end up using to, to describe me. And then there are some awesome folks who fully accept me as I define myself, which is as black and Jewish. Also, I think our water may be cool enough. Okay, now it's more lukewarm. So there's, there's really a, a range in how I am perceived. And then in terms of how this translates to me being with my family, it's funny, I, I think growing up, this was a huge point of contention for me. Let's start working on the dry ingredients. Where's my big bowl? Where is my big bowl? So growing up, whenever my mom would come to pick me up, obviously we have very different complexions and complexion matters in the world that we live in because colorism is a reality. So people would see her come to get me and they're like, oh, are you the nanny? Um, oh, that's your mom? I'd sort of get these like incredulous questions whenever she would come up to me. And I remember feeling really insecure about that because I felt like my belonging and my 
relationship to my mom was constantly in crisis and constantly being questioned. For a long time that made me feel small and less than and really doubt how authentic or valid my blackness is because if people can't see it uh, phenotypically on my skin tone, then how can I show people that this is something that's integral to who I am and integral to how I'm being raised in the world? Let's get these dry ingredients going. So we need four cups of flour. That's a lot of flour. One fourth cup of granulated sugar and some salt and combine it. So typically if you had a standing mixer, you would throw these things in the standing mixer and that would do all the work for you. I don't have a standing mixer. So we're just gonna, we're gonna do this old school like the olden days. <laughs> Here's cup number one. I'm not gonna level it or anything. Obviously, I'm not too concerned with being precise. <laughs> Get in there, babe. Get in there, babe. Okay, is it just me? Or is the feeling of flour awful? Like, that's the one part of baking I just don't like. I, I feel the same exact way about chalk. There's something about that gritty texture and consistency that makes me want to vomit a little bit, but it's kind of a necessary evil to to make our beautiful challah. So I guess I'll have to endure. <laughs> awesome. So we've got the flour in there and now we need the sugar. Fuck. <laughs> all right. Um, why is the sugar like hard? Ooh, the ground is all grainy and sugary now. Ugh got in my phone. If you're comfortable, have you experienced judgment slash discrimination from other Jews? Yes, most definitely. Mostly online, not so much in person. Mostly I'll have people in my comments on TikTok telling me that I'm not really Jewish because I'm a patrilineal Jew, which is frustrating to me because I can understand historically why, why that was the way that one verified one's Jewishness and belonging to the community and family because, I mean, they didn't have like genome sequencing you know it was like okay well the baby came out my cooter so that's my baby <laughs> it makes sense one plus one equals two most recently since my platform has started to grow on instagram i've actually started getting quite a lot of anti-black and anti-semitic comments and hate so apparently i very recently learned this maybe two days ago there are all these different emojis and symbols that anti-semitic people use as dog whistles and one that's circulating right now is the flag of thailand because it looks like their anti-semitic pride month flag which is just deeply disturbing but i've been getting a lot of comments like that um people commenting like rats and gorillas together so it's really wild i made a tiktok about this but just like when we talk about intersectionality we normally talk about it in this beautiful rosy way like diversity and inclusion intersectionality la 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 but part of intersectionality is also the violence that comes with it and the violence that comes with multiple interstices of subjected identities so that's definitely something unfortunately i experience also my camera is overheating so i think i'm gonna switch to my b camera so hang tight while i switch to my b camera <laughs> we're back this camera isn't my favorite but it does get the job done. So I made like a little well in the middle of it. You see my well, I'm gonna crack two eggs in here. Hopefully without the shell. One egg and then one yolk and I have to save the, the egg whites. So I'm gonna put the egg whites in here. And oh, let's see, we got this, we got this. Okay, bada bing, bada boom. I didn't watch Giada at home like a weirdo for like all of middle school to not know how to separate an egg white from the eggs. Oh, I jinxed it. I jinxed it. <laughs> oh no, oh no. <laughs> Y'all, I screwed it up. <laughs> I'm gonna try to fish out the yolk. Hold on, hold on. We got this. We got this. I refuse to be defeated. Look, we're making some mistakes, but that's, that's part of the fun especially a baking baking is all about the happy mistakes this is this is what makes it a good time you know okay we, we were able to fish it out successfully now i'm gonna rinse my hands off because i'm very afraid of salmonella poisoning very afraid so now i need to whisk it oh, ah. i'm making a mess i'm whisking the eggs and the yolk and the oil into a flurry in the well <laughs> While we're whisking, let's answer another question. 
How did your family interact with your other culture in a single parent household? So my mom is black American specifically and also comes from a Southern background. So growing up, I was very, very much connected to my blackness, black culture, black cuisine. Um, we went back to visit my grandparents regularly, especially for holidays and, and all that stuff. So blackness was always central. That being said, in her way, my mom definitely made an effort to connect me with my Jewish heritage as much as she was able to. Okay, I'm gonna pour this yeast in now. This is almost overflowing. <laughs> I did not plan this well. Ooh, it smells a little rank. <laughs> Can yeast expire? <laughs> she did her best to connect me with other Jewish folks who could teach me my heritage and culture. So for example, I remember in elementary school, my mom befriended this family that was Jewish and they would do Shabbat every Friday and invite us. And so every Friday we'd go to their house and it was like all the kids, me, the kids, um, we would all swim in the pool and just have a grand old time, have a beautiful dinner, play games, you know, like kid stuff that you do for Shabbat. And those are some of my earliest memories of going to Shabbat. Also, one of my godfathers, Ryan Wolfson, who I love and adore, he is Jewish. And so my mom definitely made an effort to connect us growing up. I remember as a kid going out to visit him and his mom in New Jersey with my mom and them teaching me how to make matzo ball soup. Other than that, I mean, it was it was really through other people. My mom did her best to connect me with people and bring people into my life in orbit who could be that touchstone to my Jewish culture and identity for me. That being said, I, I feel like most of my coming into my Jewish identity or becoming really curious about it was in college. And honestly, it's weird. It's almost like I had a sort of cognitive dissonance around my Jewish identity because I don't really remember seriously and intentionally and thoughtfully identifying as Jewish until college when I was enmeshed in a strong Jewish community in my college town you know whatever it's getting hot in here I have like a ring light on too I feel like I'm sweating maybe I shouldn't have worn white for this video <laughs> uh, so one person asked do you know that you're that bitch yes great question Next, is there a dish you like to make that combines both cuisines? This is an awesome question. I actually recently read an article in the New York Times about how other black and Jewish people are bringing all of themselves to the food that they're eating for Passover, which was really, really cool to read. Honestly, I think I'm just now starting to even learn how to make Jewish food, like traditional Ashkenazi Jewish food on its own. This is only my second time making kala like ever and I'm 23 years old, so so baby steps, let me, I got the, the Southern black food pretty down. Let me get my, my bearings with the Jewish food and then we'll revisit the question of combining things. <laughs> but I definitely want to, I think that's so cool. Tell us about your hair journey and how it fits into your identity. I mean, I think for a lot of cultures, hair is really, really important, but my relationship with my hair has changed pretty drastically over the years, I would say. So, Mind you, I was born in 1998. So I was born in a moment slightly prior to the advent of the natural hair movement. And the natural hair movement was basically a movement to encourage folks to be proud of their natural hair, to not feel like they have to perm it or straighten it to be beautiful, which in essence is amazing. And definitely not the first time that sort of rhetoric has been spread. If we think about like the black power movement and black is beautiful and the big afros that everyone had, like not the first time, but this was sort of a, a nouveau version of that sentiment, we'll say. <laughs> All right, lots of different angles in this video. Can't say it's not dynamic. <laughs> and now we're plopping the dough. Ooh, sticky, sticky. Maybe, let's say, until age 13 or 14, I wished so badly that I had straight hair. Oh my God, I wanted straight hair. I lived in Las Vegas for a time, and I don't know what it, the setup is like in Las Vegas now, but when I was living there, it was extremely white. And on top of that, I went to a private school for like a year and a half when I was living there. So I was mostly surrounded by white girls with long straight hair. And you know that thing that white girls do? I'm not gonna do it now because, or people with straight hair, I shouldn't just say white girls, when they can like roll, like roll their hand through their hair and it's like, uh, I used to wish so badly I could do that. And definitely fell into the feeling that whenever there was a formal event or something, I needed to straighten my hair 
in order for me to be presentable or or that I looked prettier with my straight hair and then also seeing and hearing that be reflected back to me when I did straighten my hair so that was a whole face and then once I hit high school I think I started to really love my hair I remember oh, I totally forgot about this but I remember asking my mom when I was like eight years old if I could get a perm because that's how badly I wanted my hair to be straight like the internalized white gaze and low-key anti-blackness was real <laughs> okay and thankfully my mom had the wherewithal to say no to that request and to encourage me to love my hair as it was which is quite interesting because at this time all yeah i feel like i can say that all of the black women and most of the black girls in my family were perming their hair and yet telling me not to perm mine and, and i'm glad that there was a, a disconnect there and how they chose to treat their hair and, and what they encouraged me in terms of my hair because i'm really grateful that i never had that story of well i had to chop off all my hair because it was dead you know so yes i love my hair it took me a while to genuinely arrive at this place but i have arrived also this looks ter like terrifying <gasps> we gotta trust the process though i feel like this is good stress relief just like let out all your anger on the on the dough who needs a punching bag when you can make challah? So now, we're supposed to put it in an oiled bowl. Like, look at my hands right now. It looks like something out of Halloween. It looks like something out of Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was too good. It came to me and I had to say it. So this is the current state of our challah. <laughs> Not looking too hot yet, but we'll get there. Let's get some oral in here. I'm just gonna put a little dollop in and then spread it around with my fingers. Gar, she blows. It says to cover it with plastic wrap. I don't have plastic wrap though because I don't use plastic wrap. So we're gonna cover it with aluminum foil. And now we're supposed to let it rest for an hour and a half to two hours. So I'll be back in a little bit to answer more questions and continue the process. Yeah, in the meantime, I'm gonna clean because my kitchen is <gasps> looking a little scary. <laughs> so now it's time to braid the hala. Holla at you, girl. Holla at you, girl. <gasps> oh my gosh! Look how much it grew. Oh, it smells so good. How does religion play a factor? You're a Buddhist or practice? Question mark. So first and foremost, um, you know, I would say my relationship to religion is very loosey goosey. I'm not of the belief that you have to choose one thing and be absolutely wholeheartedly devout to that one thing forever i really feel like exploring most if not all of the world's major religions is valuable and enriching in a number of ways i actually have been a nichiren buddhist since i was 12 years old so i've been a nichiren buddhist for about 11 years now which is kind of wild because on my Jewish side, we're Jewish. And on my black side, pretty much everyone is Christian. My mom was raised Christian. So long story short, yes, I'm Buddhist. I chant every single day. It's a big part of my life. And at the same time, Judaism is as well. I think something that's a common misconception is that when someone says they're Jewish, there's the assumption that that must mean that they practice Judaism. But saying Jewish and Judaism are two di very different things because Judaism is an ethno-religion. So I would say I'm ethnically Jewish. I'll celebrate a Shabbat here and there, but it, but the religious aspect of Judaism is, is a lot more informal for me. I really want to have a deeper relationship with the religious aspect of Judaism, but I don't think I'm ever going to be the kind of person that's devoutly one thing. My philosophy is take what serves you and leave what doesn't. So there's a lot in Judaism, in the Torah, that lights me up, that gives me a kind of moral compass for life and livability that is deeply enriching. And other things that I don't resonate with as much. So I'll rock with what serves me and I'll leave what doesn't. I think I braided this wrong. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at it now and I think I kind of messed it up a little bit. I'm gonna have to rebraid this. It's supposed to be braided, but as you can see with this part, this is not a braid. <laughs> These are parallel, so we're gonna have to redo this. How does colorism change your experience? This is such an important question and something that I feel like folks in the black community with lighter complexions don't talk about enough and certainly not candidly enough. I'm very self-aware that I have a lighter complexion. I'm very self-aware that people might perceive me as quote unquote ethnically ambiguous. 
And that means that I have a certain privilege as I'm moving through the world that people who are optically registered as black without any dispute, that that's just a dilemma that they don't have because they're optically perceived in a very definite and finite way. So absolutely, there's a privilege that I have. And my mom has a darker complexion than me. So I feel like we have a lot of conversations very candidly about colorism and how that impacts how we move through the world in asymmetrical ways. On the flip side of that, in the Jewish community, and I'm speaking a little myopically here because I live in the US, I live in Chicago. So the Jewish community I'm talking about is the Jewish community in the US. And the overwhelming majority of Jewish folks in the US are Ashkenazi Jews. And the majority of Ashkenazi Jews tend to be racialized as white. So if you go to different locales in the world, the Jewish diaspora is incredibly diverse. There are Ethiopian Jews, there are Mizrahi Jews, Sephardic Jews, so on and so forth. So this is not to say this is the experience of all Jewish people everywhere. This is just my experience of Jewishness here in a U.S. context. Sometimes I definitely feel the weight of my blackness when I'm in Ashkenazi Jewish spaces because sometimes they feel very white. <laughs> You know, a lot of those spaces are very white because it's mostly Ashkenazi folks who are racialized as white. It's just, it's just the majority of the Jewish community in the U.S. That's just how it's set up. So technically, you're supposed to use parchment paper for the hala and put it underneath it. I don't, I don't have parchment paper, so we're gonna use aluminum foil. That's definitely wrong. <laughs> I probably should have just braided it on the pan, but I didn't do that. So now we have to transfer. Oh my gosh. Okay, okay. Wow, how pretty. Let me show you the braided challah. Wow. Isn't she so pretty? I'm especially proud of this top bit because I feel like that looks very like, you know? This one is not as nice, but it's, I mean, it's fine. But this part, chef's kiss. Okay, we're gonna let it sit and then I'll see you in an hour. Guys, it's time to put the challah in the oven. Oh my gosh, too thick. What is that? Why is there a, a hole in it? A hole in the challah. Just patch that up. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. We're just gonna pinch it. Yeah, we're gonna pinch it. Okay, if we if we ignore that little section, this is a pretty, pretty nice looking challah, y'all. So now is the really fun part before putting it in the oven where I get to deck it out and decorate a little bit. These, these are the egg whites for my really bad egg yolk extraction job. And then, here's the kicker everything but the bagel sesame seasoning. I don't have like a brush, so we're gonna have to get creative. The last time I did this, I just used a spoon and I kind of like rubbed it in and that worked. So I think I'm gonna do that again. Also, <laughs> today is laundry day and I don't have any more clean bras. So this is like, you know how you have those bras in the back of your like closet or whatever? And they're not bras that actually really fit you that well or work that well for you, but you can, like, they can work in a pinch. That's the kind of bra I'm wearing today. And when I tell you, I feel unsupported. <laughs> okay, so why are we doing this? This helps uh, with the, the color process. So it'll just make the top really nice and pretty and golden. So this is more of an aesthetic thing than anything else. So people will want to holla at my holla. <laughs> Drop any holla jokes you may have in the comments below. Oh, what is that? Wait, there's like a bubble. You see that? Should I pop it? Oh, now it's time to add some of this everything but the bagel sesame. Oh, actually, before I continue, do we want to do a design? Like only on certain strands? That sounds like a lot. Let's just sprinkle it over. <laughs> I think it's, it looks amazing. Let me show you what's happening. We have been patting on and nurturing this loaf baby all day. And now she's about to go in the oven. It's time for you to go in, my dear. Good luck, baby. While we're waiting for the challah to bake, why don't we answer some more of your questions? Cause I definitely kind of abandoned the question. Look, I had to focus, okay? Do I get to feel like a part of both communities? I mean, yes and no. I feel like, did y'all hear that? It's like thundering outside. Ooh. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I definitely feel like a part of both communities when I situate myself in particular parts of the community that really welcome me, both via my blackness and via my Jewishness. But of course, there are always gonna be folks who don't 
accept me fully for who I am. And that was actually something that I really struggled with when I first started making content on TikTok because originally I actually wasn't making content about being black and Jewish at all. I really stumbled into that because my, I'm getting my PhD in African American studies. So I'm a black yeah. studies scholar. And most of the content that I was making at first was social commentary in the realm of black studies. And having people, mostly black people, or at least people with black folks as their profile pictures, who knows, they could have been trolls, right? Folks in my community, questioning my identity, questioning if I was really black, saying that I'm biracial and so it's not my right or prerogative to speak on these issues. And growing up, my family, on my mom's side and my black side, never made me feel as if I was less black because of me being biracial. While I'd have moments of questioning my own blackness because of how other people perceived us, that's never something that had been instantiated within my family or produced within my family. And that was really hard when I first started making content online. So I was like, oh shoot, like, this is really hurting my feelings. This is my community and I love my community and I'm quite literally doing this work to serve my community, to raise awareness around certain issues that I think and feel are deeply important. And I'm being told that I shouldn't be allowed to do this work and people don't want to see me doing this work. And that's painful. So that's definitely something that I'm still working through. But look, I can't control the body that I was given and the skin that I'm in any more than the next person can. All that I can do is weaponize the privilege that I have in service of the people that I love. And I think most people who arrive to my channels see me and they see my heart and they see my intentions and they interact with me accordingly. And some folks don't. How has your experience changed based on where you live? Houston to upstate New York to Chicago. There are so many Jewish people in New York and there were so many people at my college, which was in New York, that were Jewish. So that was a really positive experience. I met a lot of folks. I had a very strong community. I went from New York to Houston during the pandemic because that's where my family is. And I was staying with my mom when things first started popping off for, for about a year before I moved to Chicago for grad school. I mean, one, I was just kind of in the house mostly because we all were in the house mostly. So there's that, but I didn't really connect with any Jewish people in Houston. That doesn't mean there aren't Jewish people in Houston, but I didn't really get to tap into that community there. I was actually still corresponding and hanging out with my Jewish community from New York. <laughs> there is such a vibrant and beautiful Jewish community here in Chicago that I've been able to tap into. That has been lovely. So yeah, it's, it's definitely showed up differently across different spaces. Obviously I'm not in college anymore, so I'm not like living with other folks, you know, like me in the dorms. If I really want to connect with community, I have to be intentional about that. And, and I have been. All right, let's do one more question and then we're gonna take the bread out and see how we did. If you could change how you were raised in regards to this, what would it be? Mm. I mean, look, of course I wish that I was more connected to my Jewishness growing up so I wouldn't have to figure that out so late in life because I definitely have felt at times that I'm not Jewish enough because look, there's a lot stacked against me. <laughs> Cause I'm a patrilineal Jew, I'm black and Jewish. Like I didn't grow up enmeshed in any of my Jewishness. So I really am just arriving to it in a lot of ways beyond my sort of brief encounters when I was a kid. I wish my family members were around, frankly, honestly. I wish my family members were around when I was a kid so that we could have explored these traditions together. But the good news is I have connected with folks on my dad's side who I really love and appreciate and I'm able to do and learn those things now. And so I guess my philosophy is better late than never. <laughs> I don't know if I'll put that in the video because that feels a little vulnerable, but yeah, that's my honest answer. It's not quite ready, so we're gonna give it a few more minutes and then the final reveal! Oh my god! See you soon. Y'all, it's time to take the haul out! I'm so excited! It, it looks gorgeous. It really does. Look at this! Oh my gosh! Look at the artistry! Oh! And look how it's like peeling away from the little brick. Ooh! This is even better than the first haul I made. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to take photos of this. I Y'all are gonna have to wait a second. I gotta take photos. <laughs> I am extremely proud of this haul that I made. It, this came out even better than I could have hoped. I almost don't want to eat it because it's so pretty. Come look at it again. Look at her. She's gorgeous. 
look how doughy and perfect it is in there. This looks so soft and so lovely. I'm gonna cut myself a slice. We're gonna give it a little taste test. We can't end without a taste test. It is really hot though. Y'all, this tastes incredible. Wow! Like the first time I made hala, I would say it was a solid like seven. This is like a solid 8.5. Mmm. Oh my god. It might be a nine. <laughs> that one bite kind of kind of did something to me. And can you believe this started as water and a yeast packet? <laughs> and then we added in some flour and eggs and salt, and here we are. I should probably do like a thumbnail photo, right? Maybe I should have done that before I started eating the hollow. <laughs> it's okay. We'll take it now. We'll just pretend that this is the whole thing together. Okay, hopefully it's somewhere in there. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out with me for this video today. This was really fun. I hope that me sharing so candidly was helpful, generative for you. I'm also really excited to bring this part of myself to my YouTube channel because like I said, I haven't really spoken about being black and Jewish at all on this platform. So if you want to hear more about my lived experience and hear more social commentary about all this, black and jewish identity stuff uh definitely head over to my tiktok at raven reveals and i'm very excited to see you in another few days with a new video bye y'all